Let us pray together. Lord, I thank you for the honor of being able to gather in the name of your Son, that you, because of your mercy, your kindness, and all that you have done in the death and resurrection of your Son, invite us, your people, into the very depths of your presence, where we can, in fact, be cleansed and received and know the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us, O oh God, by your grace, to make room for you, that we might be commissioned, healed, and refreshed. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As I said at the beginning of the service, we've got a lot going on. Baptisms, confirmations, receptions, reaffirmations, the commissioning of new people in ministry, and it's not just a service that involves the people for whom this is happening. It also involves all of us. Because in fact, this is a commitment Sunday. In the sense that you also, Christians who are here, are also renewing your own commitments to Christ. That's the nature of what happens. Whenever one makes that commitment, all of us step in too. It's never just somebody up there and we're kind of, well, let's see how this works out. But instead what's happening is that we all step up shoulder to shoulder, figuratively, even though we're all in the room, and say, we will. We're in this together. And therefore, what I want to do in a very brief fashion, because of all of what we've got going on, talk about the nature of commitment, especially as it relates to Advent, second Sunday of Advent, John the Baptist what all that looks like, because they, in fact, deeply connect. And because, you see, the liturgical seasons, including as Advent, are meant to shine a very clear and light on a particular part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's so rich and it's so vast that none of us can take it all in at once. And so as we walk through the liturgical seasons, they're meant to cause us to stop and look at some piece of what it means to belong to Jesus Christ and what it means to be a Christian and to be his follower. So what we're asked to look at today is a person, a figure, John the Baptist. Because you see, if you look at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, why don't you turn, get me, get your leaflet out, where we have the readings. Oh, I left it. Right at the Gospel reading. Mark, the author, intentionally ties the figures of Jesus and John the Baptist together, literally side by side, in a way that, in fact, no other Gospel writer does. And he's trying to make a point. First of all, he begins by saying good news, and in fact, it's meant to be good news, as I've said, actually, all through this. If what you're hearing in church isn't good news, it's probably not the message of Jesus. You can't come out of church just feeling, that was not good news. <laughs> and if that's the case, I'm not sure it's the message of Christ. Even if the call is the tough message of repentance, it's still, in fact, good news. So he begins by saying, what I want to tell you about, what I want to write about, what I want to describe for you is something that's really good. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, meaning it's about him. It's about what he says. It's about what it is that he has done. Because the focus of our attention is always on Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about your rector. It's actually not about all these people who are making these commitments. The focus which is even architectural what we're trying to do here. Bang! What's the highlight? It's the cross of Christ. It is his death and resurrection. So what we're talking about here is about the good news of Jesus himself. And who is he? He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. But right after John sort of writes that as his opening sentence to say, here's what's going to happen over the course of these next 16 or so chapters, he immediately takes us right to John the Baptist by quoting the prophet Isaiah. Why does he do that? First of all, he's trying to say there's a profound connection. Jesus didn't just come up out of nothing. Jesus was not God's last minute idea. It's not like, oh, that didn't work, so I've got to try something else now. 
No, no, no. From the very beginning, God intended at the appointed time, the scripture says, to send his son, Jesus Christ. His coming was a very specific divine appointment in history that was prefigured and prophesied about hundreds of thousands of years prior, not like hundreds of, I mean hundreds of years, several thousand of years, prior to the coming of Jesus. And that's what we see in Isaiah. In other words, what God was doing in what we call the Old Testament was setting the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ. So, and that's important because there's some people, if you read the Bible, you get the impression that will tell you, well, there's sort of like one thing going on in the Old Testament. And then there's another thing going on in the New Testament. As if they're not related. And that's just not true. You can even get the impression from some people that it's almost as if we've got the Old Testament God and we've got the New Testament God and they're different from each other. Uh-uh. It's the same God, you see. And so, God working through the prophet Isaiah, at this point, and we'll see others, especially in Matthew, says there's somebody coming here. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, that's important. Because what John the Baptist was trying to do for his people, and this is the essence of what Advent is all about, is to get them out of all of their demanding preoccupations of village life. When you and I would talk about that, we would talk about, well, everything that's on our calendar. All of our obligations, everything that we're supposed to do. To call them out of that for a, at a brief point in time in a wilderness place, a place where there is, in fact, no distractions. To concentrate on one thing, and one thing only. To ask myself, the very personal and pointed question is, is there room in my life for Jesus or not? You see, the point of village life, much less city life or small town life, is for me to be so full of so many things, good things to do, that I actually don't have room in my life for God to do, especially some kind of new thing in my life as a believer especially this time of year. I kind of go on automatic pilot when it hits that bit. Same routine, same questions every year. Like Laurelie and I are driving over here yesterday, what are we talking about? Well, when are we gonna get your mother this year? <laughs> or you know, now we're going to spend this much money on one child. So we need to think about, you know, because it's always in some ways about parity sometimes. Uh, what we're gonna spend on this child. And is that going to work out? What are we going to do about it? I have no idea. And do you know that one person is not really happy about this person's going to be in the gift giving thing? It, it, what are we, we've got a staff party coming up in a couple of weeks. So what are we going to cook and how are we going to work that out? And what about Christmas cards? Should we use a photograph or not? We ask the same questions every single year. Don't you? You're sort of looking at me like, oh, you're not a guy. <laughs> The, my point is, is that while all of those things are appropriate to the season, and you need to know, I like them. I love the gifts and the parties and all that, and the, the tremendous joy that is, in fact, the Christmas season. So I'm not trying to be Scrooge. But my point is, is that particularly in that time, when there are so many competing demands, and in the midst of that, the overlay of all of the holiday preparation, as the secular media would say, I'm actually invited and called in this season to do something very, very different. And that is to make, even if it's just interior space, to think carefully about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And am I making room in my life for him or not. Because you see, what the scripture says in a lot of different kinds of language is that while all of those things are not in, unimportant, they're not the heart of the matter. And in fact, a lot of those preoccupations of what they symbolize are in fact going to be, just quote Peter, burned up in a great heat. In other words, something new is happening. 
A whole new heaven and a whole new earth is going to be birthed into this world at the second coming of Christ. And that is literally the most cataclysmic and important event in human history. So am I ready for that? And what does that look like? You see, a part of the image of John, he's out in the desert, which means he's saying, there's something more important than all that you're spending your time on in terms of life in Jerusalem. But even the way he looks, the things that he says, and how he lives, it's meant to say it, it's a life whittled down to its very essence. So that for John the Baptist, even in the way he, the, the, to use our language, even in the way he spends his money on his clothes, <laughs> is saying what matters is our relationship with God. And everything else is secondary to that. Now, I want to be real clear about the fact that what's being asked of me in making that kind of space in my life in the midst of the demands is not an easy thing to do. It takes intentionality. It's not just going to happen to you when you're on automatic pilot, finding room to go to the mall to buy the gift. For me, what it requires is, what I have to do, is that I have to get up earlier in the morning. Not without coffee, I confess. <laughs> but I have to get up earlier to, to make that space and, I, and even if I do make this space, I get easily distracted. I'm trying to pray and all of a sudden, bang, what pops into my head is something else that I'm supposed to do. I was talking to the forum about that before church. And what I have to do is literally have something beside me to write it down, whether I do that literally with pen and paper or whether I make a notation on my phone calendar. I, I, so I don't go, because you can't, you see. Continue to pray where this other thing is kind of needling at you and saying, you got to make sure you return that phone call or something. It's, it's like an octopus. It'll just come and wrap itself and pull it all away. So you have to say, ah, no, and you write it down. And then you go back. It's a training and a discipline process, in fact, to make room in your life to be open to the presence of God without all of the other distractions. And whether you do that through the context of reading the scripture, whether it has to do with a prayer list, whether it uses, means using one of the many Advent devotionals that are available, Advent is meant, in fact, to remind us of what is penultimately important. And to make sure that what's going on is that we're not losing our lives over lesser things. Because when you get into that place, you know what happens? You spend way too much money. Because that becomes more important than other things. You eat too much. You drink too much. You say things that you never ever intended to say, for which you regret. In other words, what that life looks like without this kind of um, discipline becomes a life that looks excessive. And all of us kind of do it because that's a part of what happens in the season, you see. And it is the anchor of saying, no, I'm actually, even in the midst of this season, doing something that is more important than that, helps you see this season from actually a more godly perspective. I put this on Twitter yesterday. The more our Advent looks like John the Baptist, the more our Christmas will look like Jesus. The more our Advent looks like John the Baptist, the more our Christmas will look like Jesus. So this is not unimportant. This is very important. That as we renew the commitments that we are making to Christ in this service, I want to ask of you, how is that commitment actually being expressed in the way that you live? Are you making interior wilderness time? to encounter the God who longs to meet you there. Because the promise is, John baptizes with water, but there is one mightier than I who said, oh, I am not even worthy to untie. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit. There is great refreshment, grace, mercy, and power that I have to have if I'm going to walk this life with any level of success at all. God's grace giving it to me, and that's what I need. 
That's why even in the promises we say, I will with God's help. And that's what the power of the Holy Spirit is all about. So that even in those desert places, the fruit of it is that I actually begin to meet God in a new and more profound way. New room is being made to prepare the way, as we sang in the opening of the hymn, is in fact to create that kind of space so that out of, to use an Isaiah phrase actually, out of the desert comes a garden, comes something new, something that God has done and is doing in your life and in mine. So I don't know what you've got on your list today for the rest of the day. I have lots. <laughs> and I don't know what you've got on your list for tomorrow. I have lots too. Tomorrow's when we get the tree. <laughs> but I want, to, I want to caution you and encourage you is do not allow the good to crowd out the best. And that's being with God and making desert places in you to prepare the way for God to do something new in you because that's what we really need. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, in the service as we in many ways say yes to you, I pray that you would give us the grace to say yes to you in making room so that we have the capacity, God, to receive from you what it is that you long to give us. Pour out upon us, O oh Lord, the refreshing presence of your Holy Spirit that empowers, heals, restores and guides that as we are about the business of getting ready for Christmas, we are in fact making room in our hearts for your return. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.